Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to the HEB Tournament of Champions. I'm sorry, that's one of the little logos on there. Um, anyway, welcome to the show. We're uh, go going to start another season of Essential Cinema. Uh, and this is one that I'm really excited about, and I hope you're all really excited about, too. Um, we, we frequently do sort of director retrospectives, and then sometimes we'll do uh, retrospectives of, of film performers, actors, actresses. Um, but it's pretty rare to do a retrospective that's centered around a member of the technical profession. And it became really apparent as we were looking at some of the, the options of uh, series that we might do that in terms of female directors, we've done a lot of series with female directors. And then we've t even tried to go through and find um, female directors who had made one or two films here or there and, and show those. But um, a certain thing happened you know, around towards the uh, end of the silent era, the early talkie eras, is that women stopped getting assignments for directing films. And so when you had um, wonderfully creative women working in films, often they were sort of shunted to the technical professions. But that did not mean that they were not able to do some of the most amazing and creative work in Hollywood. And certainly Edith Head is one of the people who comes to mind, is one of those brilliant costume designers in Hollywood. So we're gonna uh, do a series about Edith Head, uh, as you probably know, since you bought a ticket for it. Um, and we're going to um, have a couple of special guests. We're gonna introduce it, and after the show, for those of you that wanna hang out and learn more and talk, we're gonna have a little discussion period. So we encourage all of you to, to join us for the discussion period after the show. But I do wanna take a moment, because we're gonna be talking a lot about Edith Head, I wanna take one moment just to talk about Barbara Stanwyck, and maybe one of her greatest performances, uh, Henry Fonda, who's just the marvelous, and then Preston Sturges, who wrote and directed this whole thing. Because uh, we're going to be talking about Edith Head, but, you know, those other folks are good, too, I, I think. <laughs> so, <laughs> as you'll see in this film. And then another thing that I know I'm going to forget to say, and somebody uh, mentioned it to me right before I went up, so I'm thinking about it, is I should mention... Um, even though you're going to be carried away, you're going to love it, you're going to laugh so much, please don't talk during the film and turn off your phone and all that kind of stuff, because that's important. And I'll just forget to say that later once we get excited talking about Edith Head. So what I do want to do now is bring a couple of real experts to the stage, because we have, um, living here in Austin, we have the benefit of having really remarkable experts here with us in Austin. And so to be able to call up to the stage now our two guests who are Susan Mickey, of, who is a working costume designer, an experienced movie uh, and uh, a theater costume designer, and also a teacher at University of Texas, professor at University of Texas, uh, and also Joe Morena, who is a costume archivist and historian. God knows, how many, how many of those do you ever meet uh, at the Harry Ransom Center? We're so fortunate, and I'd like to bring them to the stage right now to help me uh, introduce this film. Come on up, you guys. This is Jill, and this Hello. is Susan. <laughs> Hello. Hello, you guys. So uh, we were talking a little bit in the lobby about uh, Edith Head, um, the first person to ever win an Oscar for uh, costume design, I believe, if that's correct. Um, uh, second year. Second. Second? Yeah. All right, I'm, I'm doing great. She was really, yeah, she was a little disappointed she was not the first. <laughs> what makes Edith Head such an important figure in uh, costume design in Hollywood? Edith Head was probably the first uh, celebrity costume designer. Uh, when you think of the celebrity chefs, like Julia Child and uh, 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 Paul Prudhomme and some of those, mm -hmm. uh, that was a whole genre. But Edith Head was uh, a celebrity costume designer because she was on a, a television show. What was the name of it? Uh, House Party. House Party. <laughs> And so she came into people's homes on the television and talked about how to dress, how to, what to wear, what not to wear. Was, she was the very first dress doctor um, that America had ever been introduced to. So that's why we know the name Edith Head. Um, you know, if I said to you, uh, who are uh, who is a really famous costume designer today? Uh, most people don't have a household name yeah, for yeah. a costume designer, but Edith Head has been for years and years a name that we all associate with costume design and that profession. And this was this was one of the ones that 
really made her name as a costume designer. The movie we're about to see, The Lady Eve. Uh, it's, you, any, any layman can watch this and be blown away by the costumes without even having, without even watching out for it mm -hmm. because it's such an integral part of the storytelling of this film. Right. But she was an amazing personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Absolutely. I was just, uh, it, she, I think a lot of people don't realize that Edith Head, before she made this film, had been working in Hollywood for quite some time. Um, so she first started out um, at Paramount uh, with Howard Greer and then later Travis Banton, who's uh, mostly well known for dressing Marlena Dietrich. And uh, she also got the chance when Banton was um, otherwise occupied uh, to dress Mae West, um, Carol Lombard. Um, but uh, Travis Banton and some of her other peers thought that her designs weren't quite innovative enough or uh, fanciful enough. And Barbara Stanwyck, uh, Travis Banton wasn't really interested in dressing Barbara Stanwyck. He thought like it wasn't sort of the, the, the type of glamorous woman that uh, he sort of had in his mind and, and who he wanted to dress. And so he handed over this picture to her and what Edith Head does with her in this film and really makes her look glamorous, makes her really look sexy. And Barbara Stanwyck sort of becomes this, you know, femme fatale kind of character. Like she starts getting different roles because of this film. Um, she was a real breakout. Uh, Barbara Stanwyck was a very different look mm -hmm. yeah. from what we were calling beauty at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, and when Edith started dressing her, that it it was a completely different ball game. Yeah, sort of like pra pragmatic glamour. Yeah. <laughs> and Stan, no, Stan like prior to this had been known as she was just like oh, I don't care what what I wear. She she was famous for not even looking in the mirror, which is very unusual for Hollywood stars. Mm -hmm. But but she was sort of known as being like I don't try to glam me up. I don't care. Um, and then and th after this, she was like oh yeah. Actually, you know what? Glam me up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And a lot of designers who sh she'd worked with before complained about her figure, that she had this, uh, you know, really difficult figure to work with. And, and Edith sort of being, as she would be called later, the dress, dress doctor, doctor, like her thing was looking at people and being like, I'm going to fix you. I'm going to make you look beautiful. I'm going to make you look amazing. And she would also tell ordinary, you know, mere mortals um, how to dress as well. Uh, yeah. Bar uh, uh, Barbara Stanwyck went to Paris to see the, the fashions with Robert Taylor, with her, her husband, and uh, looked at, uh, went to the fashion shows and saw all of the couture and didn't buy a thing and said, no, they dress me better in Hollywood. My designer back in Hollywood does a better job for my figure. And she was talking about Edith Head. So a magnificent film, and uh, you pay close attention to everything about this film, obviously, but pay close attention to the way that um, clothing is used to characterize this very unusual character that Stanwyck plays, because it's a, it's a, it's a film with two parts. I'm not going to spoil it for you, but it's a film with two parts where the, the co costumes are very, very different in the first part and the second part, and you'll see all kinds of little things. And we're probably gonna talk a bunch about that. We'll kind of do like a post-game show, if you will, mm -hmm. after it's over, and talk about some of the outfits and what, what she was doing with some of these outfits. Yeah. All right, Sounds so good. I'm ready to watch this movie. I don't know about Me you guys. Too. All right, let's do it. We're gonna watch <laughs> the movie, and then after it's over, we'll resume the stage, and we'll hang out and have a little conversation. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. was fun. I don't need movies to get better than that. That's, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so um, as professional costume people, as a costume designer and a costume archivist historian, uh, just watching this on the big screen, were there any sort of observations uh, that you had, fresh observations watching this this time? I thought it's really interesting to see how Edith had dresses uh, her all the way through. She comes up with a, a silhouette that she actually repeats, mm -hmm. even though the, there are different outfits, different clothes, they always have a high waist. She has interest, you know, right here, you know, a, a place to, to look in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, uh, she's uh, very broad shouldered, and a lot of this is because of the period, too, is it has um, padded shoulders. But it's interesting to see how she makes um, what she makes of, of uh, Barbara Stanwyck's body, which I think is beautiful. Um, and it's, uh, w what about you, Jill? Is there anything else you noticed? Uh, 
Yeah, I, I thought it was really great just how uh, she worked with um, sort of how you would first see Eve seated and then there would be this big reveal like that happened a couple of times where, I mean, she just looks like a knockout when you first see her. Um, she's got that beaded, you know, black uh, sort of open sweetheart neckline. And if you look at all the other women in the scene, nobody else is wearing jet black, sort of those jet black beads that she is. And so she really stands out. And then once she stands up from the table, you're like, wow, it like just got even better. Like she just looks absolutely stunning. And, and they sort of do that trick a couple of times. And then sort of as the film progressed, I mean, she's still using like beading and velvets and silk lames, but it so sort of becomes much more demure and kind of um, humble. Like it's almost like her character is is getting a, a conscience and um, some right. humility and she's being more reflective even though the sort of the fabrics and the embellishments are, are uh, you know, very similar. It seems like when she becomes the Lady Eve, her clothes are, they're lighter in color, but they also become more sort of ornate in terms of the sort of quality of the fabrics and the, the layering. That well, the yeah. that uh, gown that she wears to the dinner party is uh, absolutely incredible, and you you know who the star of that scene is. Mm -hmm. I mean, she is the most beaded. Mm -hmm. Then she changes, and instead of being the only one that's in the dark outfit, she's the one in the white right. outfit, right. and right. everyone else is in tails and and darker things. So you just reverse the focus there. But she's always the focal point. And I think that's the, the thing that a good costume designer does is, is they tell you where to look, you know, who is the most, what is the most important thing, and then inform you about the character and the story that you're, that you're seeing. W one thing that I thought was interesting reading about uh, Edith Head was that um, this was mentioned as if it were not that common. It's that you would always read the script. And I thought that was sort of unusual, <laughs> unusual that that was worthy of mention. I would assume a costume designer always reads the script, but I gather at the time when Hollywood was turning out so many movies, it wasn't always the case. Right. Well, ev even now when you work in a costume shop, uh, the costume designer has to read the script, but often the people that are working on your crew, or uh, they often don't actually read the mm -hmm. what they're working on. But the costume designer. The costume designer, who's the one who's sort of making the sort of choices yes. about the characterization. It would be really so hard forth. to make those choices. And I think that's what made Edith Head, um, I, I think, such a good costume designer is she was really a very good storyteller mm -hmm. with the clothing that and, and a good collaborator. She was really willing to work with people and, and talk to people. And um, the uh, actors and producers and directors really loved working with her because she could, very smart woman, could make those decisions. She had an undergraduate degree from UC Berkeley, um, a BA in arts and sciences, and a master's degree from Stanford in romantic languages. And she was just a really smart and interesting person. Mm -hmm. how, did, uh, how did she get started um, in, the business, uh, in this business? She was teaching um, at a, a local high school, and um, she wanted to make more money. So she went she to the her bosses and said, "I want to teach an art class." Um, she had taken an art class once in college, but she really didn't know how to draw. So, uh, but they let her uh, teach the art class. So she went and enrolled in a in a summer course at uh, Chouinard, um design school to learn how to draw in order to teach this class. And she was in the, the art studio learning how to draw and noticed that there was a, um, an ad for a costume assistant at uh, Paramount. And so she went and interviewed. And um, he said, well, I, I need to see your drawings. And she went back to the art school and she ripped everyone's drawings off the walls of all of the students who were there, and she took them in and she said, these are the things we do at the art school. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't quite lying. Though. Yeah. She said, I wasn't completely I wasn't dis completely I lying. they were mine. But she did like erase their names and put her name on them. <laughs> and, um, and she got that job then as the assistant at Paramount. 
sometimes talking to our interns when, they, when we talk about career, you, I, I like to give them little stories like that about people who faked it or who outright uh, committed fraud <laughs> in order to fight their way into the business because like sort of once you're in the door, you know, you can't fake it forever. But you can fake your way kind of onto the on-ramp. Well, when she first got hired, the who was the guy that first hired her was Howard. Greer. Howard. Howard Greer said the reason that he hired her was because she really, you know, she wasn't that great. He, great. She was a hard worker and she was really smart, and he knew that she would do the work, but um, she wasn't talented enough to threaten his job. <laughs> so he thought that she would be a good bet. <laughs> <laughs> so. um. yeah. Yeah. And I, mean, I just wanted to make the point, too, that uh, most of her other colleagues, you know, Howard Greer, Travis Banton, um, Irene, other people, Walter Plunkett, oops, everything okay? <laughs> I didn't um, do it. Everyone who uh, got into the business around that time, a lot of um, were coming from a design background or from a couture background. So or an art background. Yeah, or an art background. Um, and she wasn't coming from that background. And so a lot of her colleagues eventually, sort of as the studio system kind of started to fall apart, uh, once costumes became more sort of like off the rack, um, not so much being designed and produced from the ground up. A lot of them left and sort of created their own fashion labels or went back to couture. And Edith Head was always like, I, I would never do that. Like, I need the story. I need the story. I need the character to inspire me. Like, I would never want to just make a dress for some sort of like vague concept of right. a woman. Like, she, she really needed like a narrative and a character to drive her. Yeah. It, yeah, she was she was a, a fascinating person too. That she had really good taste, um, and she was a, a just an incredible diplomat. But they also said she could she she could work within a budget. She was very good at doing a lot of costumes for very little money, and so she was the the producers loved her because she could really turn out the work. She was very dependable. So I, I rarely watch, until I just got the idea of doing this series, I really never watched movies with an eye towards costumes and like, oh, there's another costume, there's another costume. Um, so they would sort of jump out at you. But watching this movie really with an eye towards the costumes, there's a trillion outfits in this. I mean, and so Edith Head would have done the primary costume. She would have done the Stanwicks and, I don't know, maybe the Fonda? Yeah. I think she would have probably would that have been off the had rack? something to d yeah, do uh, with. Yeah, uh, okay. I mean, th there was a man's costumer, so okay. he probably would have done that. But I think she would have had input. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, pr probably. I mean, I you would think, I think but so. I mean, during that time, they were v it those departments were very separated. Yeah. That you had someone doing men's costumes men's and, and someone doing women's costumes. But yeah. yeah, you would think, especially at the same studio and knowing the to stock and knowing that you know that that probably there was some yeah. coordination. It but seems like but primarily, it would have just been Barbara Stanwyck. Barbara Stanwyck. And during the, s the scene in the, um, in the dining room, or the ballroom, whatever it is, there's, there's a lot of like really interesting sort of storytelling going on with the different women who are sort of vying for Hoppy's attention. Right. And I, I'm wondering if maybe Edith Head would have had uh, you know, input on that. Totally, well. yeah. yeah. I think in those pr particular books, they were featured. Mm -hmm. And featured. they were about, the costume was saying something about that character. Sure, sure. So that would have been, I'm sure she would have done that kind of thing. Sure. I, I wonder if we have any uh, in our audience here, any questions, uh, comments, contributions from anyone here ab about any of this while well, we've got the experts here. Yeah, right back here. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's actually still common. It, it still happens. But um, she and e Edith Head designed for Barbara Stanwyck um, throughout her career. And when Barbara Stanwyck would do a movie at another studio, sh they would borrow her. She would go on loan from Paramount to the other studio to design for Barbara Stanwyck or for other um, actors to do that. And um, that happened constantly. And um, you would have um, the uh, Travis Banton really was the costume designer for Mae West mm -hmm. and 
you would know more yeah, about Marlena Dietrich, Marlena Dietrich, Carol Lombard. And these were also, I mean, in the old studio system, you were also under contract mm -hmm. right. as well. I mean, you could be loaned out to other studios, but you would really get a strong working relationship um, with the head designer. And if you were a really big star, then the, you know, the head mm -hmm. designer would, um, would always dress you. And I mean, there were a few times where Edith Head got to dress Mae West and Carol Lombard, but that's because Travis Banton was either doing something else, and he was also he was he was an alcoholic, and he was starting to get uh, yeah, just really really unreliable, and and she really uh, difficult to work with saved his skin quite a few times. Right. I read in one of the Stamick bios that um, it was on a movie called Interns Can't Take Money, which is a great title. Um, that we showed a couple years ago as one of our Stanwyck series, and that was the film that um, Banton was like, no, I'm not going to dress this. Who is she, Barbara Stanwyck? No way, no, she's, I'm not going to dress her. Give it to one of the assistants, and gave it to Edith Head, and that was when they sort of forged their bond. And then later on, mm -hmm. after Stanwyck became kind of glamorous, Banton wanted to dress her again, and she was like, get out of here, no way, Edith Head. So that's, right. that's, that's a nice story, yeah. whether it's true or not, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the actors were really loyal to Edith mm -hmm. Head mm -hmm. because she made them look good. And you know, if if you if your brand does everything, and she may she could really dress them, they they were not going to mess around with that. It was really interesting. Yeah. <laughs> but I I was saying that e even now, um, off sometimes a, a big name will have um, a designer that will come with them, but um, more often they will have a wardrobe person or someone who looks after their clothes. They may not be their designer, mm -hmm. but they will definitely look after their things and be your liaison with um, that particular star. And they will go with a, um, there's a, um, a man who owns Manhattan Wardrobe Supply, Tommy Boyer, who is uh, Richard Gere's costumer. Mm -hmm. And every time Richard Gere has a movie, he'll go and, and do his clothes. And you get that with a lot of, a lot of famous people. And, uh, and I, during the course of Edith Head's career, we see this same thing happen with um, Natalie Wood later comes up later on in the series, and Audrey Hepburn, I think they, they had forged special relationships together. Yeah. yeah, that was a complicated one mm -hmm. with her and Audrey Hepburn, which we could talk about later if y'all come back and see Roman Holiday. Roman <laughs> Holiday. <laughs> in a couple of weeks. Which is, would be a good idea if you did. Right back here. They they were not n costumes were not collected uh, certainly back then and they they would just go into their stock and uh, Paramount MGM uh, Western Costume had absolutely enormous warehouses of clothing all of these things the the clothes for Barbara Stanwyck would have been custom made for her they had um, large workrooms with um, tailors and drapers and cutters and first hands and stitchers and finishers and beaters, all working on those clothes to make them. Um, and, but after they were made, they just went into the stock, into storage. And even when I first started out, I would go through the stock at Warner Brothers and you would see their names in the dress. It would still be like a very famous you see, like Judy Garland's dress, and it would just be hanging in the racks w in storage. Um, so, and then they would reuse. You know, they would take them out and do something to them and reuse them. But the studios all owned all of those things. Yeah, but there was a. I think it was MGM that um, had a huge auction in the 1970s, and so. Um, a lot of like really, really important, significant costumes did end up in some museum collections and, and largely in private collections at that time because at the time most museums weren't really interested. Um, there's a longer history of collecting dance and theater costumes and there is film costumes. But uh, Edith Head was able to sort of grab some of her dresses from Paramount, for, and she she did charity fashion shows for a while. Where and sometimes it got to the point where she would just send down uh, costumes that she didn't even do, but like nobody really cared. Like they were just there to see Edith Head and enjoy the clothes. And um, and, and I'm not I'm not sure what happened to some of those uh, dresses. There was a um, an exhibition a few years years ago, um, it was organized by the Victorian Albert Museum called Hollywood Costume, 
and uh, Deborah Landis, um, who's a, a costume designer in the VNA, they tried to round up um, as many costumes as they could from as many collectors and institutions around the globe. So I don't know, there might be, I'd have to go back and look at the, there is a catalog of that exhibit and they do, you know, credit um, if it's, you know, something's from an institution or from a private collection or, or where it's from. So there's still a lot of stuff out there, but, and, and every once in a while there'll be some really high profile auctions of, of items, like I think, the ruby slip, like a, there are many yeah. versions of the ruby slippers. Yeah. I think that, but I think, but I think that's one of the one there. of the things that's so special about the Harry Ransom Center is that this is one of the few collections in the country that r that has uh, at least a slight focus on performance. You know, like costumes on things that actually were in film films. The, I mean, Indiana Jones costume is in the Smithsonian. Um, and you do have some some costumes that have achieved that sort of iconic status, but it's not something that has been collected very often. So interesting. I wonder if we have maybe one or two more contributions. I see a hand all the way in the back. I think her, her work is really clean, and it's it's always um, she has a, just an incredible taste. There's usually nothing gaudy. I, I think actually, um, uh, Tippi Hedren's clothes and the birds are it, uh, it's one of the most to me. Um, Edith Head, it, they're just absolutely perfect and beautiful, and everything always fits to a T. You know the, the the it's very body conscious. Um, she's you know there's there you can usually see the body in Edith Head's clothing. Clothing it's not you know a lot of big huge drapey. Like to catch a thief too. That's like some gorgeous clothes and and it really sort of runs a gamut between like fantasy and then just like these mm -hmm. like sports clothes and these gorgeous chiffon dresses um she she never liked to use prints or she used prints very yeah. rarely so yeah like you said like very clean very classic lines, very clean color. yeah yeah and and I, I think she just didn't didn't like prints personally, but also she thought, oh, if I use a print and then say the film comes out next year, maybe it might look dated. Maybe yeah, she she yeah she films she didn't took care a lot it. longer to come out, and they were counting on the clothes from that film to be fashion makers, to be things that people were going to want in the department stores. They were going to actually set the trends of the time. And so they they had to be very careful and really think about how this was going to look a year from now or a year and a half from now. But her her color palettes are always um, um, also very tasteful, fairly narrow, and just she she's uh, I I love the work. I think the work is actually incredibly sophisticated mm -hmm. as far as design is concerned. Um, but she also really dealt with the story and the character. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's not like you could, I don't know that you could say, oh, that was probably Edith Head, but often when I look at things, I was like, that is done so well, it probably, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably will be her. Yeah. yeah. And she works so much with Hitchcock, too, that definitely, yeah. like, you look at a Hitchcock film, and that's also like an Edith Head Edith look. Head look. I, I, let's take one more contribution from the audience. Right over here. So just to repeat yeah. that, was there, a, was there a tension with censorship over women's bodies and the way that uh, clothing showed those bodies, perhaps? Oh, yeah. Well, I think this, that outfit at the beginning on Barbara Stanwyck with the, with the bare midriff was quite... Uh, I, I think very fashion forward for that time. I was I was actually kind of stunned to see that yeah. because yeah, I wonder how that got through actually because there was a code. I mean, there was a, a yeah that was instituted in Hollywood that certain like you can show this, you can show somebody doing this, you can show someone you know. I mean, oh, you know, these guys know all about it. Right, <laughs> right. So yes, and our particular. Um, D uh, just our codes of beauty that what 
in the different eras the things that we think are beautiful. Um, and we were just talking about the fact that Barbara Stanwyck mm -hmm. wasn't the typical beauty mm -hmm. um, for what had been um, beautiful leading up to this. And then it, it changes as you move forward, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, even even since I've started costuming, it's really interesting. The uh, people's bodies have uh, have changed. When I first started out, um, an ingenue man, they're all about the same size. You know, you get when I started out, it would be a 38 regular, you know, 30 waist, 15 and a half inch neck, and now it's all you know. You couldn't. I, I couldn't fit anybody in a 38 regular suit. Mm -hmm. So it gets bigger every 10 years. It gets much, 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 we get much bigger. And now our ingenue man is usually a 42 or 44 mm -hmm. long. Mm -hmm. And so it, I'm sure that they had the same over the 40 years that Edith had worked in the business, she probably experienced the same kind of evolution, I would imagine, in both norms, what people thought was beautiful and what they were allowed and wanted to do with the clothing. And on the matter of the code, let's face it, this movie gets away with a lot of stuff that the censors, the censors must have just like taken a three martini lunch before they watched this movie because a lot of stuff got through. Yeah. <laughs> so, so next week, um, uh, we're going to show The Heiress, uh, a William Wyler film, uh, w which she's she does some pretty magnificent clothes for, and I think we'll we'll have a sort of limited group here. I think um, are you, you both going to be able to be here? I'm I'm here next week. Yeah, that's the last one I do. You're here. Good, good. Okay, I'm sorry. I was I was yeah. confused. I do this one After and that. We can, this okay. week and next week are the two that I do. Rewind the tape. Okay, yeah. So we'll both be here next week. So um, anything in particular about the heiress that that um, we should say to sort of uh, whet people's appetite for it, other than it's an excellent movie. I don't know the heiress as well. I think we'll see. Uh, we'll see. We'll see period costumes in, in yeah, that one. Yeah, mid so. mid nineteenth century. So very. These were very, very sleek. Um, very restrictions on yardage, sort of wartime uh, uh, costumes, uh, and and also, I mean, that was she. She designed that with a character in mind, but also there were restrictions. Um, I think this was forty four, mm -hmm. right? Um, but yeah, so it's going to be uh, costumes with a lot more volume. <laughs> more volume, uh, storytelling, uh, a lot of storytelling going on, and periods. So. Um, and, and whenever you see a period like that done, y you know, an earlier period done in an earlier period, you will see each one reflected. So you'll see of the, the yeah, period yeah. of the 40s reflected onto the period of the mid 19th century. In the way that S Mad Men is not strictly 60s, it's 60s filtered through like a modern exactly. era. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. so that's always interesting to me to look at, uh, primarily also makeup and hair is usually the thing, the, the first place that mm -hmm. it, oh it sure. will show, <laughs> so. Well, uh, Susan, Jill, thank you both so much for being here. And thanks to everybody for showing up and watching this with us. Thanks to Davis Rivera, who helped out on the notes for the series, too. So I just want to, I've had so much fun at this, and I look forward to the rest of the series. Thank you, guys. Edith Head. Yes. Edith Head. <laughs>